Hello and welcome to Business Daily, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Lee Before we get started, let's first get a quick check of today's highlights. The Bank of Korea trims its growth outlook and inflation forecasts for this year while holding the key interest rate steady at a record low of 1.25%. With this year's awesome summit set to be held on Friday and Saturday in Mongolia, President Park Geun-hye is expected to address growing protectionist trends in global trade. We sit down with an expert to for more. The Bank of Korea has slashed its growth outlook for the year but kept its key rates steady as it looks to assess the effects of fiscal stimulus that's on its way. But there are still expectations for more rate cuts down the road. Our Hwang Jae tells us more. The Bank of Korea has revised down its growth projection for the domestic economy for this year to 2.7 percent on Thursday. This is one-tenth of a percentage point lower than its earlier forecast in April. The downgrade came despite a rate cut just last month and the government's aggressive stimulus package that includes an extra budget worth around 8.5 billion U.S. dollars. The rates cut and the government's fiscal support measures are estimated to push up the country's growth rate by 0.2 percentage points. This, however, is based on calculations that the extra budget is passed swiftly by the National Assembly. The parliament has in the past been criticized for weakening the impact of the extra budget by dragging its feet and delaying implementation. That's why experts say the central bank could lower the key rate by 25 basis points towards the end of this year after taking a wait-and-see approach following its surprise rate cut in June. If the extra budget does not have the impact that policymakers expected, and if the pace of improvement of exports is slower than the central bank's forecast, it's likely the BOK will lower the interest rate. Heightened external uncertainties like Britain's decision to leave the European Union coupled with low inflation are also fueling such expectations. Consumer prices grew a mere 0.9 percent in the first six months of this year from the same period a year earlier, running significantly lower compared to the 2 percent target. It's because the upward pressure from the demand side was weak due to the sluggish pace of recovery. The BOK now expects consumer prices to grow 1.1 percent this year. It's the first time Korea's central bank held a separate briefing to explain why the country's inflation has been trailing its target. The governor, however, pointed to high exposure the country's prices have to external factors like commodities as being the main reason behind its lackluster growth. Hwang Jie, Business Daily. Government officials are taking questions from lawmakers on the issue of allocating this year's multi-billion dollar supplementary budget. Continuing their special committee on budget and accounts on Thursday, lawmakers from the ruling and opposition parties have been quizzing officials on the amount of money to be set aside for young Koreans' education and child care, as well as how to set up the extra budget for this year. The finance ministry says the government and the ruling Senate party will go over the details of the budget supplement on Friday. Although the details have yet to be ironed out, the finance ministry is expected to submit its plan to the National Assembly by the end of the month. The U.S. economy continued to expand at a modest pace from mid-May through the end of June, but showed little indication of sustained inflation pressure. According to the Federal Reserve's Beige Book released on Wednesday, the outlook was generally positive across economic segments like manufacturing, retail sales and real estate. Labor market conditions improved in June, but wage pressures remained modest to moderate and price pressures remained slight, showing little sign of moving up to the Fed's inflation target of 2 percent. The Beige Bug report is used as baseline data for the Fed's policymakers. The Federal Open Market Committee is widely expected to keep U.S. rates on hold when it meets in under two weeks' time.
President Bakine is off on her five-day trip to the coldest capital on Earth, Ulaanbaatar. There she will first attend the 11th ASEM Summit and later hold bilateral talks with the Mongolian president. Our Idrian gives us a peek into Mongolia's economy and tells us what Korea hopes to achieve from this trip. It's one of the least populated countries in the world with more horses than people. Despite being a relatively small market of 3 million, Mongolia has emerged as a promising niche market for Korean companies, making President Park Geun-hye's visit to the capital Ulaanbaatar all the more meaningful. After her two-day Asia-Europe meeting in the landlocked sovereign state, President Park will extend her stay to hold separate bilateral summit talks with her Mongolian counterpart. The presidential office of Chongde says one of its biggest priorities is to strengthen cooperation in tackling climate change by developing renewable energy sources and curbing Mongolia's desertification. Another major agenda is to pave the way for Korean small and mid-sized firms looking to grab a share in Mongolia's budding infrastructure market. Projects include various urban development schemes and the expansion of electricity transmission networks. A large economic delegation of 109 companies will accompany the president, of which 85 percent are SMEs. Chaude says the president's trip comes as Mongolia looks to diversify its trade and reduce dependence on China and Russia. According to the IMF, Mongolia's exports to the Middle Kingdom accounted for roughly 88 percent of its total outbound shipments in 2014, and with no oil refineries in the country, it imported 91 percent of its oil from Russia in that same year. Korea is Mongolia's fourth largest trading partner, with a total trade volume standing at $292 million as of last year, and Korean shipments to the former communist nation accounting for 94 percent of the total. The two countries will look to further grow that pie. Lee Ju Young, Business Daily. Now, established back in 1996, the ASEM awesome meeting has played an important role in stepping up cooperation between Asia and Europe in political, economic, social, and cultural areas. And this year seems to be no exception. Take a look. Under the main theme of partnership for the future through connectivity, this year's ASEM summit is scheduled to take place on Friday and Saturday in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. It'll bring together leaders from Asia and Europe to discuss a wide range of issues concerning the two continents. ASEM consists of 51 member states and two regional organizations, the European Union and the ASEAN Secretariat. As of last year, the group represents over 60% of the world's population and nearly 60% of the global GDP. Considered a venue for in-depth discussions on an array of major regional and international issues, the meeting this year will likely examine the economic uncertainties triggered by Britain's vote to leave the EU. President Park Geun-hye will also be at the two-day summit to discuss a number of topics related to Korea. They include potential risks from Brexit, as well as growing anti-free trade sentiments which are fueling protectionism. What other issues will top the agenda and how will they affect Korea? We'll take a closer look. And to tell us more about this, Professor Shin Se-don of Sungmyung Women's University joins us in the studio today. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. All right, so topping the agenda for this year's awesome summit is obviously economic uncertainty stemming from Brexit. So what issues will leaders from Asia and Europe discuss at this year's awesome meeting? Well, the slogan for this year's 11th awesome summit meeting is uh, partnership for the future through connectivity. So we have to emphasize connectivity. And in terms of the uncertainties after the Brexit, of course, we have seen uh, many uh, volatilities in exchange rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the, the summit meetings will be focusing how to stabilize exchange market in the world and also tr uh, find out how to get out of the global economic slump. I think that may be the two most important issues. Of course, there has been new development in South Sea, South China Sea uh, conflict, and also we have some uh, uh, trouble in uh, social, cultural 
uh, uncertainties, but uh, this, this time I think the financial cooperation mm. and uh, economic partnership through connectivity seems to be the main issue to, to, be, to, to be discussed in this summer meeting. Mm. Now, the initial shock from the Brexit vote was huge on the markets, as well as Japan seeing its yen skyrocket, right? So mm -hmm. what kind of countermeasures should participating ASEM countries bring up in order to, I guess, respond to Brexit as well as other growing uncertainties? Well, you know, the, the stock market has been very volatile uh, after a couple of days of the Brexit de decision, but uh, if, as the, the week draws down, the, the stock market has been quite stable, and only the trouble is to be seen in uh, exchange market, especially mm. the yen has been very strong and the pound has been very weak. Uh, so. Uh, so the, the main concern this time will be how to stabilize the exchange market in the world. And the one concern is that during the turmoil, the Chinese yuan has been pretty uh, unstable. Mm. And there has been some doubt that the Chinese government may have been directing toward the intentional weakening of their currency. So um, I think the main issue this time will be how to stabilize exchange market, especially uh, to avoid the uh, intentional depreciation. We call it uh, competitive competitive depreciation war. Mm, now, so at the awesome meeting, President Pakenay is also expected to talk about, I guess, growing sentiment over trade protectionism and try to find solutions over that. So what can we expect on this front? Well, definitely the free trade spirit in the 1980s has been kind of uh, stalling in the sense that DDA uh, discussion has been has been stalled, mm. and we've seen uh, in the presidential election in the United States, uh, both party candidates are emphasizing new wave of uh, protectionism. So it is pretty definite that the United States, as well as in the other part of the world, uh, there has been strong damage uh, uh, of uh, free trade. Uh, 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 sentiment. Mm -hmm. So I think it, we, it is legitimate to say that, that there has been evolving new protectionism in the world, but we haven't seen this time uh, first. We have seen in 1930s, we have seen in 1960s, so uh, protectionism, is, it, protectionism is kind of uh, coming and going. So uh, I think we have to get together to fight this kind of new wave of protectionism, mm -hmm. and I am pretty uh, optimistic about it. But I know you're optimistic about it, but this must be bad news for Korea and its businesses, though. Right, yeah. So that's why ASEAN meeting is, you know, really, uh, really for, uh, we need to get together to fight multilaterally to fight, um, you know, kind of growing uh, protectionism in the domestic front. So that's why the, this year, uh, you know, slogan is kind of a partnership for future mm -hmm. through connectivity. So we have to find the cooperative uh, you know, solutions to fight the protectionism and the Korea uh, as, a, as a connector between the West and East, as a connector between China and n Japan, as a connector between China and the United States. I think uh, the role of Korea is very important in this meeting, I think. Hmm. Now, there are also growing concerns over a possible currency war. So how do you see this coming? And also, how should Korea respond to these potential risks? Well. Well, we have to distinguish intentional depreciation and the market depreciation. If you look at a couple of weeks after uh, the Brexit, well, we have seen some devaluation in the pound, mm. but we, we cannot call it kind of that, that movement of uh, pound as a c c I mean, intentional. So right. we have to distinguish between the market depreciation and intentional depreciation, and every country is kind of aware about the uh, intentional uh, you know, depreciation. In that, in that sense, I think, you know, we have to look at what China uh, has been doing recently in the exchange market. So in this time, I think every country is very uh, 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 kind of, uh, uh, you know, concerned about the uh, mm. competitive uh, uh, depreciation of their currency. All right, so as Korea takes part in this year's awesome meeting, what kind of measures should Korea try to push for in order to, I guess, open trade policies and prop up falling global trade? Right, you know, China has been, you know, 
gear, gearing up their protective measure. United States is also kind of, you know, enhancing their protective measure. So globally, it is evident that every country, in order to get over economic, you know, trouble, they they are uh, building up. Uh, protectionism. So Korea, as, uh, as one of the most important country uh, uh, living on free trade, uh, tra uh, trade, I think Korea should play a very pivotal role mm. in, in this meeting to expand uh, free trade spirit. And, and that's why I emphasize Korea has to be bridge between the East and West. It has mm. to be bridge between China and Japan. It has to be bridge between China and the United States in building up new wave of free trade spirit. I think that is the main, I think, you know, objective of President Park at this time at the 11th summit meeting in Mongolia. All right. Thank you so much for your insight today, Professor. You're welcome. And that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.